Welcome to the Conseil's Voice of the Diaspora, Explore Your Past. And today I have with me Ertan Karpazlu. Ertan, welcome to the show. Hi, yeah, nice to be here. Well, hopefully we'll be having you a lot more. Hopefully, yeah. So, do you want to give us a brief introduction as to who you are? Well, I'm Ertan Karpazlu. I could say I'm the, the Vice Chair of Jazeera Association. Um, formerly the representative in Turkey, where I was based for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm back in London, um, and on top of uh, doing my work with Jazeera Association, I'm also the editor-in-chief of uh, Radio Med. It's a platform, online news platform I set up to uh, promote Eastern Mediterranean geopolitical news. Excellent. And for those of, although Jazeera has, uh, was established in 2008, and has been active actually um, in, in not only in the United Kingdom uh, or in Cyprus, both sides of the border, mind you, uh, but in various other countries, including countries such as Bosnia and, and, and Western Thrace in, in current day Greece. Um, but for those of who haven't heard of us, um, Ertan, would you mind just giving us a brief overview about what is Jazeera Association? What, what are our aims and objectives? Well, uh, long story short, we are set up to um preserve, promote um, and research uh, Turkish Cypriot's cultural heritage mm -hmm. and history. Um, it's something that we feel very passionate about as um, two fellow researchers ourselves. And we, we feel that this is something that's very important um, for, especially for the Turkish Cypriot diaspora, but also Turkish Cypriots in Cyprus and, and all, all over the world, to be honest, yeah. um, to really just preserve what we're about um, as a people um, so that we can carry this forward to future generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that brings us nicely on to uh, today's topic, actually. We'll be talking about the British occupation in Cyprus. And um, there does seem to be a, a big difference between post-British occupation and pre-British occupation, between the, the culture and identity of the Turkish Cypriots before the British came and the end result of uh, post-1960. So we'll be going into that a bit. Uh, we can start off a bit about the motives of the British. What, what was what were the British doing in Cyprus? I mean, you have Turkey there, which is, I mean, Cyprus is, can be argued as a natural extension of Anatolia. Um, it's in the same region. It's not. It's about forty miles off from the Anatolian uh, coast. But Britain, I mean, it's uh, from a completely different continent. It's far off. What were they doing in Cyprus? Why were they there? Well, just for those viewers who might not be aware what we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, the British arrived in Cyprus as occupiers in the year 1878. So mm -hmm. this was a long time ago, but not too long ago. Uh, we will all probably know people, members of our family, elders, mm -hmm. who were born and raised during the era of the British occupation, which um, lasted for about 82 years, actually, mm -hmm. and just ended in 1960. Um, and Britain was in Cyprus pretty much the same way and for the same reasons that they were also in the Falkland Islands even today, um, Gibraltar, very far from home. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why they were interested in Cyprus particularly was because um, prior to 1878, there was a huge war between the Ottoman Empire yep. and the Russian Empire at the time. Um, and in the end of the day, um, Britain decided that um, they would temporarily Mm -hmm. take control of Cyprus, um, not only to tax the people there and get their payment back in that way, mm -hmm. but also because Cyprus was um, very strategic for them in uh, securing their uh, route mm -hmm. from the Eastern Mediterranean through the Middle East mm -hmm. um, into India. And uh, that was the main trade route that Britain, the British Empire, really relied on mm -hmm. um, for their wealth and prosperity. Um, and in the, in the event of the Ottomans failing to protect that route from, from the advancing Russians. Yes. Um, Britain wanted to make sure that it had some kind of say in the region so that if it ever came to the point that the Russians would pretty much annihilate Anatolia and, mm -hmm. and extend their control to that region, um, they wouldn't be able to extend their power to the Eastern Mediterranean mm -hmm. without having to launch war on the British Empire as well. So it was um, a, a, a fair kind of decision that the Ottomans and, and the Brits mm -hmm they came to and um, as of 1878 um, British forces arrived in Cyprus and they um, opened the Union Jack yeah. um, over Cyprus um, but this was again it was supposed to be a temporary measure until the the Russian threat yeah. um, kind of subsided. Yeah I think it's important to mention as well um, further to the, the backdrop of the, you know why would the English help uh, the Ottomans well the fact of the matter is the Russian threat at the time was very real um, and they were actually causing a lot of problems 
with Ottoman citizens who happened to be of the Orthodox faith. And um, this led to many wars known as the Turco, the Russia Turco Wars. And there was one in 1877 to 78, the year just before the actual um, island was handed over to the British. Uh, in Turkish, it's known as the Doksan Harbi. And on one side of the empire, you have Russia close enough to taking Istanbul, the capital of, of the empire, of the state. And on the other side, on the eastern A Asian side, Asiatic Turkey as it was known, um, you have the Elvia Salah said, the three provinces of Ardahan, Kars and Batum. And these were uh, occupied by the Russians at the time. So they had on both fronts a real Russian threat and the Russians were hoping to extend their control into the Mediterranean Sea. This would have threatened the route for the British to get to what they call the crown, the jewel in their crown their, of India. There was um, also, uh, sorry to cut you off, yeah. but there was also not just that threat, but also mm -hmm. the threat of um, the Russians spreading their influence across the Balkans to the Orthodox communities exactly. there, the Serbians, the Bulgarians, etc. Um, and they were looking to create some kind of um, Slavic satellite state mm -hmm. that would also um, enter the Mediterranean from that direction mm -hmm. and that would have also affected Britain's uh, sea route, you could say, yes. to the Eastern Mediterranean. So the Russians were, were advancing on all sides and yeah. um, it was in both the Ottoman Empire's interest and Britain's interest at the time yeah. to work together to prevent that from happening. Exactly. And at the time, Britain had already started to secure strategic islands en route to, to India um, Gibraltar and then further down to, to the east Malta and Cyprus was the natural next um, extension in their view and in fact there was discussions in Parliament um, regarding although they were al allied with the Ottomans to actually take Cyprus by force so all of this in the backdrop um, Sultan Abdul Hamid II who was a, a, the Sultan at the time he obviously considered all of these factors and rather than having Cyprus taken by force, and rather than coming to an agreement which would give away Cyprus, he came up with a military alliance, a military strategy to secure the southern flank of the Ottoman, uh, of, of Anatolia, without giving up Cyprus. So many historians will say that Cyprus was rented, Abdul Hamid gave away the island, and, and this, this isn't quite true because actually if we look at the, the agreement, um, the, which is called the Cyprus Convention, um, Abdul Hamid makes it very clear uh, in an edict uh, in which he says um, that he has ratified this treaty under the condition that the law of the Book of Shahs may never be absent. Um, so Cyprus wasn't given away and it was still very much part of the Ottoman Empire, although their administration and military presence uh, there was absent. Yeah. So that's very important. So that's how the British came along. That was their motives to come along. Yeah. Now, the Ottomans, they came in 1570-71. They had settled many Turks, many Muslims, predominantly from Anatolia, but also from other countries there. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years of, of a, a native Muslim Cypriot presence there. Yeah. All of a sudden now, you have a people who were the ruling class, now subservient in this, in this new arrangement. I mean, what kind of impact... Would they have I mean, that's, that's a huge impact. It's a huge psychological impact, first of all, mm -hmm. um, because although Turkish Cypriots or the Muslims of Cyprus, as they were known back then, that's right. um, were pretty much always the minority in the island. Mm -hmm. um, although there are some uh, researchers that would argue that at one point the Muslim population of Cyprus increased to about 50%. Mm -hmm. but well, that's that was, according to the, the, the Bishop Kiplianos in his, in his history. Yeah, that's an estimate. Um, but that was, albeit temporary, mm -hmm. um, because just after the Turkish Cypriot uh, population peaked, um, I believe this was around the end of the 1700s, mm -hmm. um, it immediately dropped straight back down to about 30%. And that was because of the ongoing wars between the Ottomans and the Russians, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Ukraine, in the Balkans, in the Caucasus, um, a lot of Turkish Cypriot men were recruited into the Ottoman ar army. Many even went as volunteers, and unfortunately, many didn't return from those mm -hmm. from those battles. Some were martyred, some were mm -hmm. um, went missing, um, some just decided to settle in other parts of the empire. So um, the population of Cyprus before the British came 
had already declined to about 30%. So they were already on the back foot. Yeah. And then um, when the British came, all of a sudden, uh, you went from being a minority on the island that was also part of a greater majority, because end of the day, um, the majority of people in the Ottoman Empire and the ruling classes of the Ottoman Empire were Muslims, mm-hmm. predominantly Turkish Muslims. Yeah. So Turkish Cypriots under the Ottoman Empire, they, despite being a minority, they always, they always had that reassurance mm-hmm. that they were in charge. You know, they were the ones who had the links to Istanbul, to the Sultan, to the Pashas. Um, and then in 1878, even though the British didn't um, officially annex the island until 1915, mm-hmm. in 1878, all of a sudden, that privilege was taken away from them. And then I think the Turkish Cypriots suddenly developed a new uh, kind of realization mm-hmm. of their situation, the, the new status quo of them actually being a minority in the mm-hmm. island. And um, from that moment, literally uh, a lot of their, their kind of lifestyle, um, the things that were propping them up, mm-hmm. um, you know, the economic advantage that they had uh, started to decline. Whereas um, when it came to the Greek Cypriots in comparison, mm-hmm. the Greek Cypriots, not much changed for them because under the Ottomans, they were semi-autonomous mm-hmm. under the Millet system. Um, and that pretty much remained, remained intact under the British. Mm-hmm. So um, the Greek Cypriots were able to prosper under mm-hmm. the British, um, whereas the Turkish Cypriots um, you know, were very hugely, heavily impacted yeah. by the change of state. state um, it's, well, yeah. it's, it's important to, to note there that uh, under the Ottoman uh, rule, the non-Muslims uh, were divided into millets uh, nations, but these nations were not uh, based on race or ethnicity, but it was based on religion. So the, the Greek Orthodox people were divided already and, and had an established uh, ruling class, uh, some sort of, they had autonomy and an administration uh, working independently, although very much incorporated as part of the Ottoman system. So this naturally gave them a head start. Another thing which put our community at the backdrop was our, the, the Muslim Cypriots, the Turks of the time, had the a view that this was a very temporary arrangement. So they were very relaxed initially that this is going to, the British will come and go once the Russian uh, threat has, has been gone. And in fact, initially the Sharia courts were still in play. Uh, the Grand Judge, the Qadr, was still appointed by the Ottoman Sultan as well. Um, so it just shows you, and even the, you, you mentioned previously about how uh, the Ottomans had a debt in place. And in fact, the British, from the revenue of Cyprus and also from the earnings of, of land in Cyprus, would pay the Ottomans an annual fee. And this was seen by the Turks of Cyprus as what's called jizye, which is like a poll tax for non-Muslims to pay to the Muslim authority. So it just shows you, whilst the Greeks already had everything in place, the Turks were very much still thinking, well, it's going to come and go. There's no need for us to establish our own uh, authority or, or leading figures in the island. And um, further to that, we also want to know that the, when we look at the Turkish Cypriot or the Turkish Cypriot culture, we shouldn't look at it as how our grandparents were. So, you know, we're in this predicament now where we had whole villages like uh, Galebun or Lurijina, uh, which spoke Greek, although they were Turkish and Muslim. And our dialect throughout this British era has been very much affected by uh, many Greek words as well. But prior to the British occupation, it's been noted even by the British that the Turkish spoken in Cyprus was of a very high class. It was compared to that of Istanbul. So it was much, it was of a purer level than many other provinces and, and places even Anatolia. So we're going from that to going to a British occupation and the, the Greek mindset where the Archbishop of Kition who said to Sir Garnet Wolseley in 1878 that he welcomes the British to come, but because he felt that it is going to serve the interest of Enosis, which was an ideology for the union of Cyprus with Greece. Yeah, and the thing is, it's a very interesting time between 1878 and 1915, because at the beginning, both the Turks and the Greeks of the island felt that the British were their friends. Mm-hmm. So as you mentioned, the Turks always saw it as um, a temporary solution. Um, they saw the Brits originally as, as allies of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and on, on the other hand, you had the, the Greeks of Cyprus who were very excited to see the British come because the Greeks of Cyprus were hoping that, okay, 
now we have rulers who are Christian mm -hmm. and they believed that the, Brit that the British didn't actually intend on giving Cyprus back to the Ottomans, which mm -hmm. was a correct um, belief on their part. And they believed that uh, Britain would actually um, wind up handing Cyprus over to, to Greece. And this is actually something that Britain offered to Greece in uh, 1914, mm -hmm. um, because the alliance between Britain and the Ottoman Empire actually broke down in 1913, because what happened in 1913 was um, Greece, in its own war for independence from the Ottoman Empire, they were successful in taking the city of Selanik, um, or Thessalonica, uh, as is known today mm -hmm. and that was a very strategic city um, and for observers who were looking from the outside they could see that the momentum was with the Greeks at the time and um, they started to believe that uh, Greece would emerge as the superpower mm -hmm. to replace the Ottomans in that part of the world so Britain still needed an ally in that region mm -hmm. that would secure their interests. Well the Europeans also had the this false idea or this romantic idea that the Greeks of the time were somehow uh, very similar to the Hellens of, of ancient times, yeah, there although was, they really didn't have much in common. There was that romanticism, mm -hmm. but from a more strategic point of view, um, this, is, this was the thinking that was taking place in Britain. The Ottomans are going to lose, the Greeks are going to win, we still need an ally in the region, it looks like Greece is the best choice. Yeah. So this is how Britain approached the situation. And they winded up forming an alliance with Greece, which, uh, of course, upset the Ottomans. So mm -hmm. this actually put Britain and the Ottomans at odds with each other. And this led to, obviously, the, the Battle of Gallipoli, Chanakkale, yep. in 1915. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, um, Britain actually suddenly decided that, hey, we don't really need Cyprus anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the original intention with which they came to Cyprus, which was obviously to secure that route to India through yes. the Mediterranean. After two, two or three years of them arriving in Cyprus, this was actually no longer um, necessary. It became obsolete because Britain actually occupied Egypt. And Egypt had the um, deep water naval bases um, that Britain was looking for yeah. to host their warships. Cyprus, Cyprus, Cyprus didn't have that. Yeah, Cyprus didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So even as early as 1881, Mm. Three years into the British occupation, there were some people in Britain saying, well, what are we doing with Cyprus? Mm. Some people were like, well, let's hand it back to the Ottomans. Yeah. And then others were like, well, let's wait and see. Um, and then in 1914, mm -hmm. um, they decided to offer Cyprus to Greece mm -hmm. in return for Greece fighting the Bulgarians in the Balkans. Mm. And actually, it was Greece that refused this offer yeah. because Greece didn't have the means to fight both the Turks and the Bulgarians. So this actually would contradict the Cyprus Convention of 1878, where they were supposed to hand back Cyprus to the Ottomans, the rightful owners. Yes, and actually in uh, 1915, when um, Britain, British and Ottoman relations hit rock bottom with mm -hmm. the Chanakkale War, um, Britain actually decided, well, we can't give it to Greece because Greece doesn't want it, mm -hmm. but we don't want to give it to the Ottomans, so we might as well keep it. And in 1915, the Brits actually um, officially annexed the island of Cyprus. Yeah, and it's interesting because throughout that period of time as well, we started to see that the the masks that the British had in regards to honouring what they had agreed to in the Cyprus Convention was slowly, slowly starting to deteriorate. And um, there were attempts at erasing the island's Islamic heritage. And when we say Islamic heritage, this is Turkish Cypriot heritage. Um, we have Britain who actually would bulldoze and, and destroy um, Ottoman buildings with the excuse that they wanted to widen roads. They destroyed a, a graveyard, a Muslim graveyard in, in, in Famagusta near the Lala Mustafa Pasha Mosque. Um, in fact, the Girne Kapısı in, uh, well, the, Ka the Karinya Gate in Nicosia, which had an extended part, uh, which was built by the Ottomans, had a tablet which had verses from the Quran on it. And what the, what the British did was turn it to his reverse. Uh, another thing about Nicosia is that the iconic Sarai Önü Meydanı, the Sarai Önü uh, Square, which has the Venetian column there, that wasn't there during Ottoman times. The Venetians, who were actually oppressors uh, on the island towards the Greek Cypriots, the Orthodox community, because they were Catholic people, would stick a column 
in all of their colonies. So the Venetian uh, column was a symbol of occupation. And when the Ottomans came, they wanted to tell not only the Turks of the island, but the, the Greek inhabitants that you are now free from this, the shackles of, of the Catholic rule, and they removed the Venetian column. What the, what the British done, there was actually a Ottoman palace which they destroyed, this, hence the name Sarayo, Saray means palace. They destroyed that, and in the square they put back the Venetian column, hence trying to emphasize the Christian heritage of the island, while slowly erasing the Muslim, i.e. the Turkish Cypriot heritage. Yeah, that's correct, and um, Turkish Cypriots in this time, they really started to suffer. Um, the British started to interfere with the Efkaf. Mm -hmm. um, Can you tell the viewers what the Efkaf is? Well, Efkaf or Vakaflar, as we would say nowadays, mm -hmm. um, it's you, you could call it um, a grouping of uh, Vakafs or foundations, mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically it controls a lot of communal po properties yep. that are owned by the Turkish Cypriots. It's a very charitable organization as well. Mm -hmm. So what would happen in the olden days is. Um, very wealthy uh, Turkish Cypriot landowners, um, they would actually donate some of their lands mm -hmm. to the Efkaf, and the Efkaf would um, either rent those lands out, or they would, you know, they would make some money from those lands somehow, mm -hmm. and then that money was used to kind of help fund uh, places like schools, places like mosques, and um, basically anything that was part of Turkish Cypriot public life, mm -hmm. and that was, you could say, the heart of the Turkish Cypriot community, and to a certain extent. It mm -hmm. still is today, it still operates in the same way. Um, however, during the British time, there was a lot of uh, British interference mm -hmm. in, in this uh, in this organization. And then they started to install um, administrators who mm -hmm. were uh, very loyal to, uh, let's say, the British presence in Cyprus right. from among the Turkish Cypriots, okay. might I add. So we could say puppets, to use a, a blunt yeah, word. <laughs> yeah, if we're going to be blunt right. about it, they were puppets. Right. These were people who were uh, on the British payroll, payroll right. who had who saw their interests aligned with the British interests mm -hmm. from among our people. And they were given money and titles and such to... Yeah, of course. And, encourage um, them in this. And unfortunately, they weren't always the most honest people as well. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine something, a, a huge responsibility like FCUF. You need somebody who's honest and who's trustworthy mm -hmm. um, who, to lead that. Um, but during the British era, we saw that many of those properties that were intended to benefit the Turkish Cypriot community mm -hmm. um, as public communal properties were actually privatized. Right. Um, and this privati privatization was often done in tandem with um, elections within the Turkish Cypriot community right. to um, help certain uh, candidates mm -hmm. gain votes um, and therefore seize control of the Turkish Cypriot politics. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this was going on. Um, this wasn't the British doing it directly, but they were doing it through members of the Turkish Cypriot community. But the, but the, so the, the British were actually encouraging a culture of treachery of deceit corruption of corruption yeah and um, in fact Evkaf lands were often given away for votes as well yes and we're, we're talking so. about we're talking about mosques we're talking about madrasas schools yep. we're talking about turbes shrines yeah yep. and today if you ever walk around north cyprus mm -hmm. uh, particularly you'll find that there are certain shrines of muslim saints mm -hmm. in people's houses yep. in people's shops in um, newly uh, constructed schools, like yeah. in in the in the kind of playground of the school, yeah. probably in really, yeah, in these really random places, mm -hmm. um, and these are all private properties. And you're thinking, well, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. um, and it's only now, really, that we're starting to ask, wait a minute, what actually happened here? How did this tour yeah. wind up in someone's back garden? Yeah, but we also know of the British directly confiscating Muslim Cypriot, Turkey Cypriot lands. I mean, we have a number of examples. Um, the famous um, Sadr Azam, or Prime Minister of Vizier of the Ottoman Empire, um, his descendants actually had lands in Ashelia, a farm. And this was taken away by the British. We know of uh, the current situation that we're in with Marash Varosha, and the original name was Varosh, which is an Ottoman Turkish word, uh, meaning outskirts. 
uh, this land was given away to, and rented. And, and, but what, what we need to keep in mind is, regardless if it's the British who confiscated the land, or if it was corrupt individuals from the Turkish community, we, there is a concept or there's an underlying law to do with the EFGAF called Ahkamul Evgaf, which is laws of EFGAF, which is internationally recognized to this day, in which it says that the property donated to EFGAF as a pious uh, charitable, for, for pious charitable reasons, will remain so uh, for eternity. So you can't sell it, you can't transfer it, uh, that property will remain as such. Um, so regardless of the British giving it away, that action itself is illegal. So we need to know about this and understand the situation that we're in very much was impacted by the direct uh, influence and theft of, of the British occupation. And yeah, the, the British uh, authorities at the time, after 1915 particularly, they started to target um, a lot of Turkish Cypriot landowners mm -hmm. um, because they saw the Turkish Cypriot landowners who were huge landowners at the time. Mm -hmm. Many of us are the, the descendants of um, ours, yes. to say landlords. Landlords, yeah. Um, and they started to put them under some kind of political pressure, mm -hmm. either to sell their lands or to uh, you know, give their lands away for free. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the, you could say, the more affluent and uh, wealthy Turkish Cypriots mm -hmm. Um, felt that the, the best thing that they could do was to sell their lands in, in Cyprus, mm -hmm. take the money and migrate to Anatolia. Mm -hmm. And we see this particularly um, starting from around 1915. Mm -hmm. um, many Turkish Cypriots um, winded up migrating to Anatolia. Yeah. And this um, increased actually after 1925, when Britain officially made Cyprus the crown colony. And yeah. Britain actually went to the Turkish Cypriots mm -hmm. and said, either you guys accept British citizenship, in which case you have to give up your Ottoman citizenship, mm -hmm. or if you refuse to be British, then you can maintain your Ottoman citizen citizenship, but you have to migrate mm -hmm. to other parts of the Ottoman Empire. And we find in that time, thousands, perhaps up to 20,000 Turkish Cypriots. Yes, initially there was 20,000. Yes. Yeah around that figure, if not more, mm -hmm. um, winded up migrating to Anatolia and they set up um, new villages, new towns, especially around Antalya. But just to put this into context, mm -hmm. our population in the early 1900s mm -hmm. um, was roughly 80 to 100,000 people, wow. no more than 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. So imagine 20,000 people at least mm -hmm. have left that so we're is, talking roughly a, about one third of our population. A to a third of your population mm -hmm. has just gone. And these are, the, these are the ones who actually have the money to migrate. Of course. Or these are the ones who actually have something to lose if they remain in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. So this was the in, entire economic elite mm -hmm. of the Turkish Cypriot community migrating mm -hmm. to Turkey. And what's left behind are the villagers, the farmers, the shepherds, yes. the ones who aren't very well educated. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that's the foundation upon which uh, we have, we are based today, mm -hmm. and this is why we were always throughout the era of the British occupation, and even today, mm -hmm. a hundred years on, even today, when you compare us to the Greek Cypriots, um, their education standards are a lot higher, that's right. their uh, wealth, they have a lot more wealth, and that starts from that period in the early 1900s when the Turkish Cypriots were impoverished. Mm -hmm. during the British era. So from going from the ruling class to becoming impoverished um, and at that time as a result <clears throat> of being impoverished uh, we didn't have, the Turkish Cypriots did not have enough schools, they did not have enough Imams and the Greek Cypriots of the time um, who were radically influenced by the ideology of Enosis and uh, Megali there the great idea to create a neo-Byzantine empire of which Cyprus would be a part of, they felt that the Turks of the island were very much an obstacle for them reaching that goal. And as such, they would try to use the impoverished Turkish community and try to convert them to Christianity. They were successful in some cases. In, well, there were many uh, recorded villages which had completely turned to Christianity and there were others such as Fasulla in, in, in Limassol, which were partially converted. Now, 
we can't think of this from a modern context in which everyone chooses their religion freely and it doesn't really affect the ethnicity. At that time, if you're Muslim, you are Turk by default. And if you're, if you're Christian, you're Greek. Um, so by turning Christian and by offering money and women and land and, 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 and such and, and, and teachers and priests to offer services, they were able to convert uh, a big portion, a, 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 well, a portion of the Turkish Cypriot community. So we've lost Turks, Muslims from the island who have migrated to Turkey. Mm -hmm. We've lost a portion of our community through the conversions to, to Christianity. And at the same time, during the world wars, we have Greek communities from Anatolia and from various other islands, uh, which are considered as Greek islands now, having refugees of theirs move to Cyprus. So there's a whole demographic change and shift within this British occupation. And thankfully we had a, what well, from our ruling class, uh, Ziaï Efendi, who was not only a, a mufti, uh, educated to the level of a religious leader, he was also uh, in the field of academia, he was a teacher, and he was actually voted in the, what they call the Mejlisi Milli, the national uh, conference mm -hmm. that they had in Nicosia, elected as the community leader, the Reisi Millet of our community. He was the first elected leader of the Turkish Cypriot community, and yet we never hear of Ziya Efendi. And actually, uh, one thing I have to say about Ziya Efendi mm -hmm. is he was very resistant to the British occupation of Cyprus, um, so much so that he was avidly campaigning mm -hmm. for Cyprus to be returned to the Ottoman Empire. And at the end of World War I, there was a, a huge international uh, conference in Paris called the Paris Peace Conference. That's right. 1919 and everyone from all over the world all community leaders national leaders they were all headed to paris to attend this peace conference because this peace conference mm -hmm. was going to set the foundation for the status quo of the entire world mm -hmm. um, and you know it was after this peace conference that other um, agreements started to come into fruition such as uh, the treaty of lausanne and yes. the treaty of um, you know other treaties mm -hmm. so zii Effendi set out was about to leave cyprus mm -hmm. to go to paris to attend this conference representing turkish cypriots yeah. and for some reason no one knows even till today no one knows the exact reason why mm -hmm. the british prevented him and his delegation from going so everyone who was anybody was at that conference apart from turkish cypriots yeah. various communities from various colonized nations and yet the turks of cyprus had no representation due to the British not allowing him to, to go to the Paris Peace Conference. Yeah, and we can only imagine how things might have been different had we had representation exactly. in that conference. And we must remember at this point that um, terms such as Turkish Cypriot uh, were not used as something separate from the Turks of mainland Turkey. It was Kıbrıs Müslüman, the Muslims of Cyprus, they were the Turks of Cyprus. and. Uh, an individual of the elite of the time, very much of the time of Ziya Efendi, Kaitazade uh, Nazım Efendi, who would regularly contribute to the newspapers of the time, he, in one of his poems, uh, says that Osmanlıyık pek şanlıyık, which means we are Ottomans, how uh, we are glorious Ottomans. So there was very much of uh, a pride and identity that they were Ottomans, very much first and foremost, even during the British occupation. Yes, and uh, there were even, believe it or not, this is something that is completely skipped in our history books. And yes. I think, especially in schools in Cyprus, we need to learn about these things. They were, there were Turkish Cypriots, um, you could say, groups that were set up to resist the British occupation of Cyprus. That's right. And um, one of them uh, that we've, we've read in the books is called Türkiye ile birleşme örgütü. We're not sure if this is the official name. Yeah. Um, this is probably just a name that was given to them. We're not even sure if they had a name. Mm -hmm. But this was a group of individuals um, from the Turkish Cypriot community who actually uh, set up an operation to rescue um, prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. These were Turkish prisoners of war who were taken from the uh, battlefield of Gallipoli in Çanakkale. Yep. They were brought over to Cyprus by the British yep. and put into prisons in Maosa. Mm -hmm. And this group of Turkish Cypriots actually arranged an entire operation to break into that prison 
um, free the prisoners from there. Yeah. And then from there, they were going to raid an arms depot, take control of weapons in the island and physically resist mm -hmm. the British occupation until the British left. And then they would give the island back to the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Um, but probably because of a mole that was within the group, yes. um, that operation um, failed. Mm -hmm. All of those individuals were rounded up by the British and they were thrown into uh, prisons. In the Kyrenia Castle. Kyrenia Castle yep. in Buyukan. Buyukan was also used as a prison at the time. Mm -hmm. And they were treated very badly. Uh, many of them were assassinated in the prisons. They were poisoned. Yep. Um, among them was uh, was an Imam called Imam Nuri Effendi. Yep. He wasn't himself assassinated, but what was happening within um, the prisons mm -hmm. was that Brit the British were killing off certain Turkish Cypriots and they were just um, not even announcing the death. They would literally take the body and they would just bury them in a hole somewhere and they, these people would be for forgotten about. Yeah. So what Imam Nuri Effendi was doing to make sure that Turkish Cypriots who were being killed mm -hmm. um, had the right um, treatment as Muslims yeah. um, at the time of their death was when a, a Muslim, a Turkish Cypriot, died in one of those prisons, mm -hmm. he would create some kind of diversion to... Um, make sure the British the British didn't notice that this person had died. Mm -hmm. And then at night time, he would sneak out of his cell with the body mm -hmm. and he would bury the body secretly somewhere in the prison and he would read the, the necessary du'as and, and do the janazah prayer um, on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, and that was his legacy. That was something that he felt he needed to do as a Turkish Cypriot Muslim. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're saying here then is that the Turkish uh, of Cyprus had tried the political way and then they thought well our brothers from Anatolia and from other from the eastern front of the war had been imprisoned in Famagusta in what's today the Gülsenem camp and they wanted to free them and start an uprising to return Cyprus as was legally stated in the Cyprus convention to its owner to the Ottoman Empire and we have these esteemed individuals who put their very much so their life on the line to, yes, they to did. Yes, this. they did, and unfortunately uh, for them, um, by 1923, the Ottoman Empire was no longer a viable option because it ceased to exist. Yes, and it was replaced by uh, the secular um, Republic of Turkey, mm -hmm. and after that, it was a game changer because right. Turkey in 1923 signed the Treaty of Lausanne. Mm -hmm. Turkey accepted that uh, Cyprus was was British territory. Yep. Um, Turkey was quite frankly no longer interested in, in Cyprus, um, at least on an official level. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as the Turkish Cypriots in Cyprus at the time were trying their best to get Turkey's attention mm -hmm. um, and trying to hand the island over to Turkey, unfortunately they weren't receiving um, as much interest as they would have liked. Although, uh, to give Turkey credit, there was an, an ambassador that they sent to the islands, their mm -hmm. first ambassador, I believe, called Asaf Bey. And Asaf Bey was a keen supporter of the Turkish Cypriots. Um, at first, Asaf Bey was actually helping Turkish Cypriots leave Cyprus right. um, and seek refuge in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and this was something that he was doing out of the goodness of his heart. Mm -hmm. However, um, after a while, he started to realize that, hey, look, there's too many Turkish Cypriots now that want to leave Cyprus and, and uh, move to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And he was worried that if it continues, there's not going to be a single Turk left in Cyprus. So yeah. he actually halted the initiative because he understood uh, that uh, sooner or later, the Turks, the presence of Turks in Cyprus would become necessary mm -hmm. um, to Turkey. And eventually it did, obviously, in uh, 1974. Mm -hmm. So um, really it was because of Asaf Bey, actually, who halted the migrations. Mm -hmm. Um, that we still have Turks in Cyprus today. Otherwise, the island would have been emptied. Yes, and I think yeah. um, much of the Turkish Cypriot elite at the time were also aware of this issue. There were articles released in, in Turkish newspapers in Cyprus saying that we need to halt um, the number of Turkish uh, Muslims migrating to Turkey. Otherwise, as you said, there won't be any Turks left on the island. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, there was a number of attempts um, such as uh, from Galeburno, um, Ali Efendi Hussein Babaliki, who would uh, support people with his wealth to remain in, in Cyprus, hence the name Babaluk. Uh, he was acting as a father 
to people. And there was articles written to try and halt this migration. As we said, the Treaty of Lausanne you mentioned, I mean, this is often seen as a victory for, for the Turks. And in many ways, we need to find a nuanced uh, look at this, because in one way it created the Republic of Turkey, yes. However, we can't just look at it as if it was a perfect or ideal agreement. I mean, the people who went to the, to the, the Article 20 and 21 is what states that Turkish Cypriots to remain as Turkish citizens had to leave Turkey, which led to the 20,000 Turks leaving. But there wasn't a push there to say if Britain was to ever leave the island, vacate Cyprus, then it should be returned to Turkey. This this wasn't stipulated in, in, in the Treaty of Lausanne. And I understand Turkey's predicament because after the war, uh, they needed to, to increase the population of Anatolia um, with Turks because much of it was empty. But in doing so, they left the demographic of Cyprus very much changed. So we must, I feel... So first of all, Cyprus and the Turkish Cypriots were to protect Anatolia, to protect Turkey, put themselves on the line. You know, they were given away to the... To, they were put in British hands and eventually stolen, but they still remained loyal to the Ottoman Empire for the protection of Istanbul and Anatolia. The Turkish Cypriots went through this struggle all the way up to 1960. The Turkish Cypriots went through a demographic change, and yet they remained loyal to their nation. Yes, and now we're in a situation today where um, probably about 70% of us uh, live outside of Cyprus. We've been born outside of Cyprus. That's right. And um, still today, um, although we do face many challenges as a diaspora in terms of holding on to our language, holding on to our culture, holding mm -hmm. on to everything about our cultural heritage and identity, um, I believe that the reason why still today we have young Turkish Cypriots who can speak Turkish, mm -hmm. who are interested in, in their history and their identity, their religion, um, I think that's a testament to the Turkish Cypriot spirit um, of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I believe if it, was, if it was anyone else, they would have assimilated um, much, much earlier than we have. We're just beginning to assimilate now. Um, so uh, to a certain extent, this is part of evolution, cultural evolution. These things happen. Mm -hmm. um, but to another extent, we're now at a point where we have to acknowledge that we have a past, we have a history, we didn't yes. come out of nowhere, we, we didn't hatch out of an egg, egg yesterday. Yes. Um, and we need to actually uh, honour these individuals mm -hmm. um, who have fought and sacrificed their lives mm -hmm. so that we can have the, the pleasure of calling ourselves Turkish Cypriots today. So Elton, to, to wrap up and to kind of uh, reiterate some of the points, we find that prior to the British coming, the Turks of Cyprus were a very religious community. Um, they had many tariqas, they were very fond of Sunni tariqas, such as the Mevlevi and, and, and the Naqshbendi towards the end. Very religious, they were very loyal as Ottoman subjects, as, as being part of Ottomans. They, they sensed that they were Ottomans, first and foremost. And as the, the nationalist kind of um, ideals uh, were on the rise in Turkey, the Turks of Cyprus very much were in line with these changes and always remembered that they were part of the Turkish nation. Um, so before that we see this, today we see that perhaps certain elements of our culture, of what makes us Turkish Cypriots, such as religion for example, isn't so prominent. Uh, we see that monuments created, uh, established by Turks, um, have either been destroyed or are just left to decay. So I mean, just to kind of wrap up, what, what, what do you have to say in terms of like, how can we look back at the British era and review it in the sense of a, of a cultural shift for our people. I think we need to, as a people, acknowledge um, how detrimental the British occupation was mm -hmm. for us as a people. And a lot of other, we're not the only people who came under British occupation mm -hmm. in the world. And obviously a lot of people also came under French occupation. They had their own experiences. Um, and now we're in a, a post-colonial era where a lot of people from a lot of different communities are coming to terms with the detrimental um, impacts that they face as a people under these uh, foreign occupational powers, mm -hmm. which still affect them today. Um, and they are now starting to come to terms, to terms with that. And I feel that as Turkish Cypriots, we also need to come to terms with what was done to us. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, what was done to us was actually so detrimental 
that we have no memory of it, we have no recollection of it. And uh, this is one of the reasons why Jazeera Derne has been set up, because we, we want to uh, shed some light on, on this um, particular part of our history so that we can move on as a people in a healthy way, mm-hmm. um, understanding what we've experienced and what we've been through. Ertan Karpaz, it was very um, insightful and thank you for sharing your input. Hopefully we'll have you um, as a regular attendee on this show. Let's see, hopefully, yeah. And for those of you who may be interested in further content, please check the Jazeera Derne uh, page on YouTube and also on our other social media sites. And for today's show, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon with another episode.